Fertility Friday Q&A answering your top fertility questions. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, and today we are answering your top fertility questions. So first, we'd love it if you'd subscribe to the channel. This is gonna help me spread my message of fertility education and empowerment and understanding your body to more people. Go ahead and subscribe here to help us grow. If you have your own question, these questions can be asked in the comments of this video, or you can go to the community tab and you will see an ongoing thread and we will pull questions from there to answer each and every week. All right, let's dive in. Hysterosalpingogram versus hysterocontrast sonography. Which one should I get to check tubal patency? So these are both tests that can evaluate if your fallopian tubes are open. An HSG is a hysterosalpingogram. This is a test where it's done with x-ray. So this test has a speculum and a catheter goes to the uterus and then you inject dye and you can see the outline of the uterus and you can see the fallopian tubes. This is a very good test for fallopian tubes. However, you're flat, it's just an X-ray, so it's a two-dimensional picture. So it's not the best test overall for the inside of the uterus. A hysterocontrastosonography, people can also call this a saline sonogram or a FemView or a bubble test. This is usually a test where you put saline into the uterus and you watch with ultrasound, and then you can inject air bubbles through that saline to see the fallopian tubes. The nice thing here is that with an experienced ultrasonographer, you really can see very nicely the inside of the uterus and those fallopian tubes. However, somebody who's less experienced may miss something on the fallopian tubes. I do both of them, depends on the patient scenario and their risk factors and what our long-term outcome would be. So if your doctor feels really comfortable with one, I think that's absolutely fine. One's not markedly better than the other one. They just are different ways. One uses x-ray flat films, the other uses ultrasound. So it depends on what they're most skilled in. Could you please explain what is the goal of TSH during IVF and how is the best way to get there? Thanks for the amazing work you do. So I have a whole video, actually I have a whole video series on thyroid. So please go check out part one, understanding your thyroid and part two, thyroid and fertility and pregnancy. Part two will answer some of these questions in more detail if you suffer from thyroid disease. So your TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. It's the hormone that comes from your brain and talks to your thyroid gland to get your thyroid gland to make circulating thyroid hormone. Now your brain then says, hey, do we have enough thyroid hormone? And if it does, it will send out a normal amount of TSH, like good job thyroid, I'm gonna send out just the same amount the system is working. If it thinks there's not enough thyroid hormone, then suddenly your brain's gonna send out an increase in TSH to try to get your thyroid to send out more thyroid hormone. And if your brain's like, whoa, there's way too much thyroid hormone, then it's gonna send out less TSH saying, hey guys, we're good, we don't need any more. Most fertility doctors use the Endocrine Society recommendations, which is a TSH of less than 2.5 if you have infertility or if you're trying to become pregnant to decrease the chance of miscarriage since that's the first trimester goal. So if your thyroid hormone is over that, then typically we're gonna to wanna to be treating you with medications like Synthroid or Levothyroxine in order to lower that down. Most of us will not find it satisfactory to try to treat with food or lifestyle in this incidence because the complication or the potential risk of pregnancy loss or even developmental delay if you continue the pregnancy because the baby is dependent upon maternal thyroid hormone until about 11 to 13 weeks. So that's a really serious outcome and the medication is relatively cheap, it's easy to access, and it's proven to be effective. So most of the time you'll see us put you on medication and follow your TSH levels to make sure we get you into a good zone. Can you discuss embryo grades and mosaic embryos? What should you do with your mosaics? This is a really complicated topic and I'm gonna to try to just simplify it down. When we biopsy an embryo for genetic testing, the embryo at that stage is about 300 cells. What we like to think about is it's like a soccer ball. This is the analogy I always use. It's like the soccer ball and the embryo on the inside is a little ball of cells on the inside of that hollow portion of the soccer ball. We take five to eight cells from that outer area, the placenta or the trophectoderm. The embryo is then frozen and these cells are sent off for evaluation. When that happens, what we're doing is looking to see if those cells are genetically normal. So running just a chromosome analysis on them. Not testing for single gene disorders unless you do that test, but generally when we talk about mosaics, we're looking for aneuploidy, 
random chromosome abnormalities that can increase with age. This is the top abnormality in why people have miscarriage or why we see lowering in pregnancy rates as we get older. So in general, what a mosaic is, is that you get two different results in your findings. So if we go back to that soccer ball analogy, a mosaic embryo has both black and white pieces on it. And so depending on where you took your sample, you might get some black and some white, but the embryo is just one of those colors because the embryo can push out some cells. And so when we get a mosaic embryo, we don't know what the truth is. Is the embryo the normal cells or the abnormal cells? Mosaics can further be defined as low level mosaics and high level mosaics. Low level mosaics are embryos that have most of their chromosomes, most of the cells say the chromosomes are normal, but there are some cells that come back abnormal. So that's a low level mosaic. High level mosaics are where most of the cells are abnormal, but some of the chromosomes do come back normal. So you're left wondering what the reality is here. Further studies have shown that mosaic embryos may correct themselves, so the embryo may very well be normal. And this is why there have been live births from mosaic embryos. However, they're pretty much considered tier two and tier three embryos, meaning the live birth rate on average for a low level mosaic would be closer to 20 to 30%, whereas 60 to 70% is normal for a genetically normal embryo. And a high level mosaic is usually like less than 5%, but possible. So do you throw away your mosaic embryos? I tell patients right now, do not throw away your low level mosaics. We may consider transferring them if there are no further embryos available, or there may be better diagnostic tests in the future because this is a rapidly changing part of our science. So right now, should you get rid of your mosaics? No. Should you transfer them? as a last resort, because they might be abnormal, you might have a higher risk of pregnancy loss, you might have to undergo invasive genetic testing, and I just want you to be prepared for whatever that may have. Is there a weight limit to fertility treatments? Also, does having a high BMI affect fertility? This is a complicated question. So is there a weight limit? Yes and no. Every clinic is gonna set their own limit, and sometimes the doctors get to set it, and sometimes it's anesthesia or the surgery center or the place that you utilize for IVF treatments. So when we talk about IVF, a lot of different centers have a BMI of 40 as a cutoff. And that is because if they are not a full surgery center with full equipment to intubate and to do full on surgeries, they're just more of a procedure room, which is very acceptable for IVF and probably standard in a lot of places. The risks of having surgery and not being able to fully intubate a patient may be too great for anesthesia to feel comfortable with. So just like some outpatient surgery centers have BMI requirements, often the BMI may be set. And so this could usually be around 40. Now, some places have a BMI cutoff for all treatments altogether. And we have one for ovulation injection medications or IUI that's at 50. And it's not to be discriminatory. It is because there are worse perinatal outcomes. So complications in pregnancy and outcomes for baby and mom, but also because your rate of success is lower as well. And so we do want to set a reasonable goal where I don't want you to have to lose so much weight that you'll never be able to get pregnant, but we do want to drop you down into a zone where you have the highest chance of success and ultimate success, of course, which is having a live born baby. You should talk to your clinic about what this is. Is there a limit for IVF? What is it? Is that reasonable? What does that mean for you? And I've had some patients who've had to go to other clinics because the length of time it might take to achieve that goal was just really unreasonable. And I, I agreed with them. So your clinic may have their hands tied, but this is something you should ask about. Any info on how long the lining is impacted following a DNC? For the most part, your lining should not be impacted. So a DNC is a dilation and curtage. It is really named after how we used to do it, which was dilating the cervix up and then using a sharp curette to bring out all the endometrial tissue. Now a DNC can be done for a variety of reasons. It can be done for heavy bleeding to try to stop your bleeding. It can be done for pregnancy loss and incomplete miscarriage. It can be done for a pregnancy termination like an abortion. It can be done for a retained placenta. It can be done for an infection as well. So depending on the etiology and why you do the procedure, it can have an impact on what is happening. And very often for pregnancy termination or loss, we are using just a tube that is suction based. So you're not using that sharp scraping. So having thin lining after just a suction cura is very rare. So typically your lining will grow back in the next cycle without any issue and it all will be fine. However, if you had a postpartum heavy bleeding, a retained placenta or an infection, and that tissue was really needed to be removed and because you had a medical emergency, then you do have a higher risk of Asherman syndrome or a thin uterine lining or scar tissue in the uterus. I usually would tell patients, hey, I want you to make sure you're building that lining back up. We wanna make sure that your period's getting back to what it should be. And if you're noticing 
absent periods after a couple months from your procedure or very, very light periods, you want to talk to your doctor and get an evaluation. I hope these questions helped. I love doing these Q and A's, so you have to keep submitting the questions. So please submit questions under this video, like it and share it so we can keep doing this series. And you can also ask on the community tab. As always, thank you for being here. Please subscribe to the channel. You can get more information on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or follow along on the As a Woman podcast. Thanks friends.